know how many of you are knowledgeable about the Holy Spirit. Like, I think we like, oh, Holy Spirit, he's cool. Like, I hear, I've heard about him. Some traditions, like, really don't talk about the Holy Spirit unless they happen to read it in the actual scripture. Some believe that the Holy Spirit was just for the Bible times, no longer applicable to us in many ways. And, and yet I grew up in a home where we talked about a lot of big theological words. We talked about everything from eschatology. We talked about the triune God, the Trinity, sometimes even rapture, and those kinds of words I grew up around. I was very blessed in many ways. Also the dork many times in conversations. But I I loved it. And as I started to form my own family and trying to figure out what we did with our kids and introduce them and have them familiar with the word. We had a 10-year-old, five kids, down to one who was uh, about two years old, um, walking around in diapers. We try to have these family Bible times, these devotionals, we called them. And I would ask the kids, uh, as we read through one of the stories, like, who wants to be the one with the deformed hand? And they would fight over the de- who wanted to be the deformed hand one. It was kind of funny. And then we'd be like, all right, who wants to to be the demon-possessed man, like, I do, I do, you know, and then, so I would read, and the demon-possessed came yelling, and they would come in yelling, doing whatever it is they thought they were doing, and what's interesting is, like, they never really all wanted to be Jesus, but kind of wanted to be Jesus, so we had this weird dynamic in our living room, but inevitably, when I would ask something, one of the top responses that always floated to the top at the end of the day, just because of my take on things, was Holy Spirit. I even have staff people, I won't mention their names, uh, but they'll say, like, oh, you like, Holy Spirit, that's Luis's thing. And you hear it a lot in what I talk about. So it doesn't matter what the question was, like, hey, how do you think this happened? And they're like, Holy Spirit? Like, you can't go wrong. Like, that's the, that's the answer. It's like, Jesus or Holy Spirit, right? You can't really go wrong with one of those answers. Um, and I, I think that's, in many ways, still true in life today. See, the Holy Spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity. And as Christians, we affirm a triune God, meaning there's three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the triune God has always been and has always been present in creation and still is present in our lives today. When we read in Genesis chapter one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When we hear this word God, we're talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Here we get this vivid image of the spirit of God moving over these waters to create something new. The spirit was active in creation, creating time and space as you and I know it. And the spirit in many ways is still active today and still in the business of creating new things. The Spirit is able to give shape to that which is formless, that which is empty, he's able to fill, that which is contorted or mixed together, he's able to separate and create order. But the Spirit of God was present at creation, but not only was the Spirit of God present at creation, so was the Son. The Apostle Paul asserts in Colossians is the Son is the image of the invisible God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit manifested in the Son, the firstborn over all creation, for in him, Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. In that same chapter of Genesis we just read, we we come across this really interesting phrase. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, other versions say. So this God, this triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, decides that he's going to make humanity like him. And notice that the plural, all of a sudden you're talking about God, 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 and then very quickly turns to plural. It's not that they're crazy, they're not going crazy about their pronouns or anything like that. It's really implying something very different. It says, this is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together to create humanity in their very image. God created humanity, and when he did, he breathed into us. And this word in the original language in the Hebrew of the Old Testament speaks to this idea of the breath of life or the spirit is given to us. So from the very beginning, this whole idea of breathing, you have this idea too of spirit, of pneuma, where we get this in the New Testament, this word. So here's the Father breathing into us the spirit of God, thus making us image bearers. That means that every single one of us 
has the imprint of God on our very souls, on our spirits, on our bodies. And it's hard to think about in that way. Because sometimes it's like, I don't really think so. But the reality is when you read scripture, and as followers of Christ, we should be reading scripture and letting scripture read us in many ways, that we are marked by the very breath of God. However, as a result of sin, and we know the story, many of us, of, of sin entering the world through Adam and Eve, and this idea of sin is more than just doing something bad. This idea of sin is the breaking of shalom, the way things were intended to be. So anything that stands against God's purposes and the way things are to be, that is a sin. It may be an action or anything else, but as a result of that, human nature is now fallen, is now broken, is now marred damaging our relationship with God, damaging our relationship with one another, also with our environment. And immediately this plan goes into place of God beginning to redeem the world and all of us back to its original state and restoring the image of God within us. So this, we see that the spirit of God was active throughout the entire Old Testament, not just in Genesis. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't just randomly appear all of a sudden in Acts in the formation of the church and falling upon people. We talked about the tongues of fire and you shall be my witnesses. It is not the first time the Holy Spirit appears. It's been present. He has been present all throughout scripture. In Genesis, in Exodus, the spirit of God came upon those who were putting together the things that belonged in the tabernacle. In Numbers, we read that the spirit of God falls upon 70 elders and anoints them for leadership. In Deuteronomy, Moses lays his hands on Joshua and asked that the Holy Spirit would fill him so that he would continue to be the next leader of Israel. In the book of Judges, there's a long sequence of examples of the Holy Spirit coming upon all these judges so they can carry out the work that God has done. We see this pattern in the Old Testament of the Spirit of God falling upon specific people for specific tasks. In 1 Samuel, the Spirit of God comes down on Saul to prophesy. In that same book, David is anointed as the Holy by the Holy Spirit to be the king of of Israel. In 2 Peter, looking back to the Old Testament, he says that all, that all the prophets spoke by the Holy Spirit, carried by God. See, in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah prays for a double portion of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, is not a bad prayer at all for us. Even today, those of us who say, yes, I follow Christ, I know the Spirit of God lives in me, but sometimes we're longing for something more. It is not bad to pray for an extra portion of the Holy Spirit. And when you pray for the Holy Spirit to draw near, let me tell you, he's going to do something in you and he's gonna ask you to do something, so be prepared. It's not just for the warms and fuzzies and stuff that we can get out of the Holy Spirit. It's God moving in us. In Job, he looks back and recognizes that the Spirit was present at creation. He says the Spirit of God was breathed into us, acknowledging that reality. When David is conflicted and confronted with the sin, he prays, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He understands that the relationship with the Father was fostered with, through the Spirit. He also recognizes when he pens these words, where can I go from your Spirit? Spirit, realizing he can't go anywhere where God is not already. In Isaiah, the, the prophet writes these words that are also echoed in Pentecost by Peter. He says, I will pour out my Spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. In Isaiah 61, also quoted by Jesus in the New Testament, says the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me and because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. There's also mention of the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel, in Daniel, and a lot of the minor prophets. In Joel, you come across this masterful prophecy and it says, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even the servants of both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The prophet Micah, who was fighting injustice, declared that he was full of the power of the Holy Spirit. The prophet Zechariah, when faced with an impossible task, declares, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. See, the people throughout the Old Testament had an understanding of how God interfaced with them and it was through his spirit. It wasn't just new and introduced in the New Testament. The New Testament talks about a little bit more about this personalized, the fulfillment of the prophecy that was 
coming for specific people, for specific tasks, now is given to people personalized. And now he comes to dwell within us. And this is the primary way in which God begins to work in us, making us more and more into his image. Timothy Tennant lists out seven ministries of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. He says that the Holy Spirit is the source of all life. The Spirit is the one who makes God's revelation known to us. How do we even know that there is a God? How do we begin to understand? Through the Spirit of God. Number three, the Spirit grants us wisdom and discernment. Number three, the Spirit anoints us for effective service and leadership. It's not just self-preparation and everything we can do in our own ability. There's something that comes just infused by the Spirit so we can do this work. The Spirit then convicts us of sin and unites our hearts so that we may not sin again. There's a work of the Spirit. We'll talk about that in a second. And the Spirit manifests the power of God to heal, transform lives, and even transform our society. And number seven, the Spirit universalizes God's presence to all nations. Not just for a select group of people, but to all. These ministries are highlighted in the Old Testament, but in many ways are reignited in the New Testament. And one of the things that I love about the way God reveals himself to us over and over is that he takes visible things, things that you and I see every day, to teach us invisible truths about himself, about his purposes for us. So you get images like the dove, a cloud, fire, the breath, wind, water, oil, all pointing to the work at some fashion, at some level of the Holy Spirit. And we come across that in the Old Testament and then even more deeply so in the New Testament. So from the get-go in the New Testament, we encounter the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus and anointing him for ministry. The Holy Spirit seems to tie everything from creation to the birth of the church and yet to the ongoing work of the Spirit in our lives that is deep and lasting. See, as Jesus goes forth in his public ministry, the Spirit of God is present in him where he's preaching and he's proclaiming the good news to the poor and he's healing people. He is empowered by the Holy Spirit for ministry. And then as you keep reading the narrative of the New Testament, it's like not only did Jesus do it, but he says, now I want you as my disciples to do this as well. And you're like, ah, hang on. Like, that's cool for Jesus, cool reading those stories, but I'm not sure how I'm gonna enter into that. And it's crazy, it's mind-boggling when you stop to think about it, how the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that we just sang and just celebrated lives in us, doing a work in us. Jesus showed us how to live our lives fully in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, I want you to do the same. Everything that Jesus invites us to do, he's done it first. And he says, because of my spirit, you can do it. Even if you don't think, even if you don't feel like it, you can do it. You can do it. Like, think about it. Like, it's this whole idea. Like, it, it is possible. He wouldn't ask us to do something we couldn't do. And he also won't prohibit us to do something we couldn't do. Whenever Jesus is prohibiting us from doing things, it's because we can do them. But he's, when he's inviting us to do things, it's also because we can do them. I knew for, I know for a long time I was incredibly focused on this idea of whether or not I knew Jesus or asserted certain theological beliefs. And I was concerned about whether or not certain people believed. And if they believed, then that's all you needed. Because the word of God says, believe in the, word of, you know, believe in the Lord and you shall be saved. I was like, what else do you need? Well, I don't need anything else to be saved except the completed work of Christ. But it doesn't stop there. Unfortunately, I made the beginning the finish line for a long time. And I made that for people. There are churches that only focus on whether or not you come to Jesus and you had that moment. Did you have that moment? Did you have that moment? Which is important to have that moment. But that moment only marks the beginning of something new, not the end. Because deciding to follow Jesus is the beginning of a new life in Christ that is lived out in the spirit. It's so much more than just simply saying, I believe X, Y, Z about the Bible and saying, yeah, I believe these things. And then I go back and I live my life and it doesn't seem to affect me at all. Except when I show up here on Sundays occasionally or in my Bible study group, if I'm in one. But it seems these things that I declare and we sing together seem to be detached from my everyday life. In many ways, I think that's the church's fault and what it's become. 
But when we go to scripture, he's saying it's totally integrated into every part of who we are and what we do. If we're saying that I believe in Jesus, we're essentially saying that I'm placing my trust in Christ. It's about aligning our lives to God's word. It's allowing our agendas and our priorities, which we all have at some fashion, and allowing them to be restructured by God's spirit. It's allowing the spirit of God to come and heal us from past wounds that prevent us from being fully present with others. It's learning to let go of sin in our lives. Yes, I'm forgiven for the sins that I've done. And by the way, we, are, we sin because we have a fallen nature, and that's the very nature that the Spirit of God comes to restore in us. I, we sin because of our nature. We don't gain the nature because we sin. And the Spirit of God comes to move there. And then suddenly I begin to let go of things that I held so dearly. Activities that I used to engage in and found incredibly entertaining. As I've grown with Christ, suddenly they don't appeal to me as much. It's not that that those things might have been evil or really bad, and I don't want to give examples because I'm not here to judge anyone. But to say there are things that were not healthy, were not beneficial for me. And as I started aligning my, my life to God's word, I started to say, maybe I shouldn't look at that stuff. Maybe I shouldn't do these things. Maybe I shouldn't use those words. Maybe I should, or maybe I should do more of this, or maybe I should engage in this. And God began to work. And I'm able to let go of unhealth. I'm able to let go of addictive patterns and attachments that are in my life, preventing me from, from being present with what God wants. Following Christ means I'm unlearning certain ways of thinking that I've held for so long in adopting new ways of thinking. I think this is what Paul's referring to in Romans when he talks about the renewal of our minds, engaging in new activities. Not because I have to in order to get saved. It's because I am saved because of the grace and love of God that I say, I want to continue in this process of being more and more into the image of God. It's not so that I get more brownie points with God. It's so that God can have full access to me. 100% access to Luis, that I want to grow in this stuff. I may not like it, but he's gentle with us. He's patient with us. And I begin to die to certain things. I come alive to certain things. I think we talked about that last week. See, when Jesus saved us from sin and death on that cross, he saved us into a new life. And for me, it's preposterous to think that I can come to Jesus and profess my faith in Jesus and remain the same and nothing, absolutely nothing changed in my life. Our culture will say, you can believe whatever you want, do whatever you want, Jesus, God still loves you. Yeah, he still loves you. But are we gonna let that love transform us in any way? And I understand that coming to Christ doesn't change us overnight. That's the beauty of his grace. Yes, I believe what you've done, but then suddenly I begin to recognize unhealth things that I wasn't, aware of, and the spirit begins to bring awareness, regardless of what our circumstances may be, really good or really down, really difficult, it doesn't matter. I press into God, and we're made more and more into the image of Christ, only in the manner in which you and I are willing to yield to his spirit. All the things I just talked about, the spirit does, we can't do on our own. If we could, then by definition, we don't need the Spirit. It's like, hey, God, watch this. And then you just go and do it. And God's like, awesome. Here's another jewel for your crown. And you're like, woo, I got this. This is so cool. And you're like, man, I'm not as good as so-and-so. But this isn't about the, the same Spirit. It begins to quicken your thoughts, your decision-making process, your ability to see things to even feel things differently. The Spirit of God has been at work in our lives before we even became aware of the Spirit working in us. It's what us Wesleyans refer to as provenient grace. And you're like, I'm not sure I know all this stuff. You don't. You enter it in, and the Spirit of God begins to open our minds up to the understanding of God's Word and how things are connected. And those of you that have been in this process recently can begin to see, like, man, God's doing something. People like, I'm wanting to get more involved. I want to do it. That's the spirit of God moving in you, around you. 
Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would also convict us of sin, and we don't like to talk about sin a whole lot in church. We understand that there is sin, but we don't like to talk about sin in our midst. Jesus said when he comes, he will prove to the world to be wrong about sin. He says when he comes, he will prove to the world, this is John chapter 16, verse eight, when he comes, he will prove to the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. There's a growing force, I think, in our culture to dismiss this idea of sin. It's no big deal. You have your truth, you have your reality, do what feels good to you, it's no big deal. You can be a Christian and do whatever, really, whatever you want. In many ways, being a Christian, a Christ follower, doesn't really make you different than the world. Other than you might have KSBJ versus some other radio station on there. Or wear a t-shirt that says, no, follow, share Jesus. But he says, I want to change you from the inside out. He says, about sin, because people do not believe in me, and about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. He will convict of sin. Conviction of sin is not the same thing as condemnation. So when you do something you know you're not supposed to do, that's condemnation, and you, you, you just do it, but then you begin to have this guilt and this shame, and you beat yourself up. Some of you have had this for years. I've lived that in my own life, and wondering and thinking the worst about myself, assuming the worst. That condemnation is not of God. God doesn't work that way to try to change us. Instead, he comes to us, I think, very gently and says, hey, what you're doing, I don't want you to do that anymore. And you, you, you know, something you're doing, you're like, I've done this forever. I never thought anything of it. That is the spirit of God working. It also may be manifested in a friend coming to you and saying, hey, have you thought about this? You're like, oh, okay, that's not the Holy Spirit, but it could be the Holy Spirit speaking through your friend. You're like, I'm not sure how to explain that. I was going this way, and then I started now going this way. That's what the Bible refers to as repentance. Repentance is a reaction to God's love and grace because of what he's done. He says, Luis, I love you so much. I am rescuing you from this, and now I am setting your feet upon a solid rock, and I am directing your paths. Will you now trust me? And he begins to change the way I think about myself, about others, about circumstances, about where my dependence and my reliance and my help comes from. Suddenly, I live life differently. Things I deemed important, I don't anymore. It's not that I'm better than. It's like something is shifting inside of me and he's shaping me. But the Spirit is gently guiding me, guiding you. Press into prayer. Press into the in Bible reading. Don't do certain things. Do these things. That's the spirit of God. He's teaching us how to be present as Christ was present. And he's present even when times get tough. Even when we mess up again and we're wondering, do I, is this even real? Scripture says that the spirit of God testifies to our spirit that we belong to Jesus Christ. You need to hear that. Some of you need to hear that this morning. You belong to Jesus Christ. There are huge implications for us saying that we belong to Jesus. That means I don't belong to myself. I don't belong to this world. I don't belong to, to Satan. I belong to Jesus. Now I want to see what the word says about this. That means he is my father. I am his child. I belong to him. And something begins to take place in me. At the same time, the Holy Spirit is producing something in us that Galatians 5 defines as love. And then there's all these words that define what love is, and so does 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's not this fluffy, emotional, sometimes purely sexual love that this world wants to tell us about. It's this idea of this holy love that God is and says, I want to transform you from the inside out. 
I want to shape you into my image if you allow me. Because I think there's something within all of us that craves to be different than we currently are because we know that we can be better because we know we were created for something more than simply waking up and going through the motions day in and day out, whatever it is that we do. And we're longing for purpose and we're longing for meaning and it's not about our jobs and we're things, should I be a teacher? Should I be a lawyer? Should I be an attorney? Should I be a garbage man? What should I do? And we're worried about money and our finances and everything. God's saying, that's not even what I'm worried about. Because I want you to know me. I want you to know my spirit. I want you full of my spirit. Regardless of what you do and regardless of what you're facing, because all of us will face difficulties in our lives. And I think in a sense he does this collectively and he also does this individually for us. Because the spirit of God is living inside of us. So if Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, if he is truly ruler and leader, that means you're not. So quit acting like it. We come to God with all of our plans and everything else, and we say, hey, bless this, and then we get ticked off because he does it. He says, let me guide you. Let me reorganize your life. Because it is the Spirit of God who begins to speak to us. It's the Spirit of God who begins to impart wisdom and discernment. Anybody need wisdom and discernment this morning? You're facing something, you're like, man, I could really, that's the Spirit of God. Regardless of what field you're in of work, of whether you're a student or not, or your age, there are decisions you need to make. Let me tell you, yield to the Spirit and he will speak to you. You're like, I, I haven't been reading. I, no, no, just, Holy Spirit, would you show me? I got this decision to make with my parents, or I got this financial business deal, or I'm going on this trip, or you know there's something you're not, you sh you're not sure if you should do. He's gonna lead you. See, the Spirit of God is one of the ways that God is present with us. He says that we are his temple. We are the dwelling place of the Spirit here on earth. Where he begins to free us and heal us and give life to us in a brand new way. And because of the Spirit, we're present differently. We don't longer follow the desires of our flesh and go on the whim of stuff. We're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna now intentionally think about what God wants for me. As children of God, we're led by the Spirit. We're to walk in the Spirit, meaning we're no longer fearful. We're no longer slaves. We're no longer our own. We're no longer dead, but we're alive. The Spirit helps us in our moment of weakness. If you're weak, say, cry out to the Holy Spirit. I have situations come across my cell all the time of people texting or calling, needing prayer, needing something. You've lived them. Some of you have texted me. I don't know what to do to fix it, but I know what to do. And it's cry out to the Holy Spirit. And the beautiful thing is God's children is the Spirit is also interceding for us with groans that we do not understand shaping things, creating things. He says, would you enter into this? But God wants to work something special in us. See, God didn't just send Jesus as, man, I really want to inform the people of earth. I really want them to be inspired. We're gonna create church and hopefully once a week they'll hear something that inspires them. Good information and great inspiration. Here we go. Let's do this. Let's change the world. He didn't do this. He says, yes, it will require information. You may or may not be inspired. But I want to transform your life. Will you let me? It will only happen if we yield to the Spirit of God. And here's the deal. If we're to be his witnesses the Spirit of God must first do a work in us. See, we're not called to be witnesses or to merely testify about some theological facts about Jesus or to recount a story in the past. We're witnesses of his power and his grace and his move in us, of his healing, of his grace, of his freedom in our very own lives. So you can't be a witness to something you haven't experienced. You can't share Jesus if you don't have him. You can't give what you don't have. 
Let me tell you, when you open yourself up to the Spirit of God, it's a little uncomfortable. Because especially in our culture, we like to be in control. I'm not saying you're gonna uh, lose control or anything crazy, but it's, he's gonna rub you the wrong way in the sense that he might tell you something you don't want to hear. Because in many ways, I'm pretty good. I used to be really bad, and now I'm not. But here's what I find out. The more I press in into my relationship with Christ, there's things that he begins to reveal that I become aware of. Hey, you're impatient. That was rude. Gossip. Lust. Envy. Unforgiveness. I'm just talking about me. Y'all you go next. <laughs> God begins to move. Convict. And I said, okay, God, in this area. And it's not usually a list that long at once. It's just one little thing. And you open yourself up and God begins to move. And then I'm able to witness of how God is working in my life, not this fully completed work. Don't fall into the lie that, oh, so you're saying in order for me to witness, I must get it all right, and then I go witness. It's in the middle of, it's in the midst of, of our dysfunction that he draws near to us, of our pain, of our uncertainties, of our inadequacies, insecurities, our lack of knowledge, our uncertainty of, of life, our doubts, our imperfection and our weakness. The Spirit draws so close to us, and he says, would you let me guide you? Would you let me lead you? And what I found is that he wants to work in us so that he can work through us. See, many times I think we want God to work around us, for us, but not really in us, because I got this. But I think many times when we reach that place of desperation, it's like, I can't anymore. You seem to hit a wall of sorts into a wilderness in our souls. The Spirit is there, preparing, working, eliminating, healing, freeing. And some of us are in a place today that we need the Spirit of God to breathe on us again. In the same fashion that... Christ, after the resurrection, entered into a room where his disciples were. He said, peace be with you. And after he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. He wasn't sending them because they were perfect. He was sending them because they were followers of Jesus Christ. He understood what was ahead of them. He understood what was behind them. He understood what was in them, and yet he says, I'm sending you. Because you'll be my witnesses. And with that, he breathed oh, on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This idea of him breathing is also this idea of him creating something new. We're a part of this, y'all. He breathed in creation. Jesus breathed upon his disciples, and I believe he can breathe on us today. There's something new and different. I'd love to pray for us before we go into communion. Jesus, we thank you for who you are, for loving us the way that you do. Lord, we need you more than ever. And sometimes, you know, we don't know the answer, but I'm inclined just to blurt out Holy Spirit like my kids did. Holy Spirit, help me. So Lord, would you breathe on my brothers and sisters now? Those that are crying out for you, for something new, for something different. Would you breathe on them? And they receive what you have for them. At every level. We thank
thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As we move to the table, we declare together that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, and that Christ will come again. And on the night before Christ gave his life up for us, he took the bread and he says, this is my body. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me, so take and eat. And then he took the bread. He gave thanks. And then he broke it. He was broken so that you and I could be made whole again. In the same manner, after the supper was over, he took the cup. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant, through which there is forgiveness of sins for you and for many. And every time you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. The table that is up here, it's not foundry's table or some denominational table. It's the table of the Lord. For those who are willing to live at peace with one another and with him, it's for you. For those of you that says, I'm broken and I'm in need, and I recognize a need for a savior, this table's for you. This table's for us. That's why anyone's invited, regardless of your background, where you are. We always have a moment of confession, not because... You have to get right with God in order to come forward. But in this very moment, we're recognizing the forgiveness of our sins in that moment of Calvary. Just take a few seconds. Concentrate what way it helps you. And if there's anything that you have participated in with an attitude or behavior or withheld when you know you shouldn't have, because you haven't loved well, or you know straight up you sinned, just confess that to God. And know that you are forgiven in Christ Jesus. And it's with the heart contrite before God that we come to this table. I ask those that are serving to take their their spots as I pray over these um, elements now. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us the body and, and blood of Christ that we may for the world, be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one for each other and one in ministry to the world until Christ comes in his final glory. We ask all of this In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. As you come forward and you receive the wafer, I encourage you to come forward and put your hands out like this in a cross. This isn't a trick, just like, oh, just put your hands out up. And allow them to place the body of Christ in your hands. And you take that body that bread, that wafer, and then you dip it into the wine. You can either take it with you back to your seat. You can use your seat as an altar. You can take it immediately. But we just pray that this would become the body and blood of Christ for us. But the way that God is present with us now is through his spirit. You can take that and say, Holy Spirit, would you empower me? If you like prayer, I'm gonna hang out in the back where it says connection point. And I'd love to pray with you if you just need something over your life. So let's come as the Lord leads. Come out to your left, down the middle, on both sides, and then back around. Let's come as the Lord leads you. In Jesus' name, amen.